Thank you so much, Rachel. And it's really a pleasure to be part of this series. Um, I wish I could see people in person, but uh, it's nice to be here with, uh, you know, here from my uh, home in East Middlebury. So uh, tonight's talk is, uh, as the title says, Television Cop Shows, Police Violence and Black Lives Matter. And in this talk, I'm gonna be uh, focusing um, in the second half on The Wire, the television uh, show from the 2000s. Um, in the first half, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the television cop show genre and really think about how it has represented police violence and the way in which I would say a lot of what we are experiencing today um, has resonance with what the history of television has presented in terms of what uh, police do, how they are represented um, and seen through this very uh, long lasting genre. So um, first I just wanna mention, just give a, a content warning here over the course of some of the videos I will show, there are brief graphic displays of violence, um, they, both real and fictional. Um, they are brief, but it, I, I think it's important to be to know that going in. Okay, so the first question I wanna answer, or consider at least, is how do television cop shows matter? I mean, why is this something that we should know about and think about critically? And I would say there are a number of important uh, facets here. For one, for many viewers, cop shows are the primary way in which they experience the police. I think a lot of communities, especially communities uh, more, of more wealth and privilege, have very little daily interaction with the police, but have a lot of interaction with the police on their television screens. Uh, the cop show has been one of the most popular genres throughout television's long history, and I think for many people, the first images that they have of police are in these fictionalized cop shows. And I think they're the most long lasting and ongoing images as well. And this genre really helps frame a range of cultural norms around key concepts like law, crime, citizen, violence. And what we're experiencing now as we really reckon with what it means to engage with police violence in a way that many communities have been engaging with it for decades. But I think for many uh, people, and I say viewers, because the way that we've experienced this reckoning is largely through video, through the citizen video of cell phone cameras showing uh, the horrific acts that police have uh, undertaken to uh, against black citizens. And I think it's important to think that many of the preconceptions that we have as we watch those videos and we deal with the impact of this reckoning, it goes against these long histories of the way in which co television cop shows have made us think about who police are and how they function and how they fit within these broader uh, cultural norms. And when I think about the, these cultural norms, Something I always tell my students at Middlebury is that we should treat representations as a menu of possibilities. When we are thinking about the reason why we look at television representations, I think that it's not because it tells us this is what you should think. I don't believe television brainwashes us, but I do think that television provides this menu. It's very hard to imagine something that you have not experienced or witnessed and television allows us to witness a lot of things and to uh, bear, uh, you know, vicariously have an experience. So I think that this menu of possibilities of what we do see on television is really important. And also just as important is what we don't see. And as uh, I'll talk about, I think that we'll see throughout TV history, there's a lot we have not seen about police action. So, I'm gonna do a really brief history of the TV cop show. It is not meant to be comprehensive. I'm just gonna select a few moments and think about how the genre changed throughout the 20th century. And then I will um, go ahead and focus then on The Wire. So in any conversation about the police uh, show on television, we have to start at Dragnet. Dragnet is, I would argue, the most important TV cop show, and really it's the first TV cop show 
debuting on television in 1951 and running throughout that decade. And always it was one of the most popular shows on television um, throughout the 1950s. Then it went off the air and then it returned again in the 1960s. So when we think about Dragnet and the importance of it, there are a few things that we have to have to be aware of. First is that it was produced in direct collaboration with the Los Angeles Police Department. Um, Jack Webb, who we see here is the star of Dragnet, but he was also the producer and directed every episode and wrote many of the episodes as well. And he was tight with the LAPD and really worked with them to come up with uh, stories. Many of the stories on Dragnet were case files from the LAPD. They shot on location at the LAPD uh, precincts and got access to police cars, et cetera. So it was very much wor it worked in tandem. And in that way, while it was a fictional show, it was highly uh, tied to these official uh, protocols and official ways of representing the institution. One of the things that Dragnet did that was really important was it downplayed violence. Jack Webb had a rule that on the show, police could not draw their guns more than once every seven episodes. Because in talking to cops, he said most police work is not violent. Most police work does not involve drawing your gun or engaging in any sort of violence. So really, he tried to portray cops as working stiffs, as people sort of doing investigation, filing paperwork, walking the streets, etc. And they really tried to downplay the violence, which, as you can imagine, television as an entertainment medium, violence is a lot more captivating and engaging than doing paperwork. So... This representation as the first primary representation of police on television was quite important. And we'll see how it moves away from that in future years. At the same time, Jack Webb and Dragnet as a whole believed in norms of justice, morality, and authority in, with a total lack of ambiguity. It was There was no question that the police were a righteous institution that were working for the side of good and that criminals were a threat and something that needed to be uh, protected against. And police work was seen as hard and, uh, and noble, but it was righteous. And I think that this was really important that every episode of Dragnet, um, while they didn't always catch the criminal, there was this sense that they were doing the right thing, that police were dealing with citizens in the right way and handling criminals appropriately to protect citizens. And that was really unambiguous. So I want to go ahead and, and show you a clip from Dragnet. And this is from the 1960s uh, return. It is a clip that's pretty well known because it's a monologue. And Dragnet, for those of you who may remember Dragnet, um, was a show that loved monologues. And uh, Jack Webb loved to do monologues. And this was one of his monologues in which he really is trying to establish what is a cop in talking to a young man who um, was uh, trying to be a cop, but decided that he may not want to be. Um, and he's trying to give him a sort of pep talk as to why being a cop is the right thing. And I think it's really instructive about the, the moral vision of what the police are. So let's watch this clip. I think maybe I can understand how she feels. And maybe she's right, Culver. It's awkward having a policeman around the house. Friends drop in, a man with a badge answers the door. The temperature drops 20 degrees. You throw a party and a badge gets in the way. All of a sudden, there isn't a straight man in the crowd. Everybody's a comedian. Don't drink too much, somebody says, and the man with a badge will run you in. Or how's it going, Dick Tracy? How many jaywalkers did you pinch today? And then there's always the one who wants to know how many apples you stole. All at once, you lost your first name. You're a cop, a flatfoot, a bull, a dick, John Law. You're the fuzz, the heat, your poison, your trouble, your bad news. They call you everything, but never a policeman. Maybe she's right. It's not much of a life unless you don't mind missing a Dodger game because the hotshot phone rings. Unless you like working Saturdays, Sundays, holidays at a job that doesn't pay overtime. Oh, the pay's adequate. If you count your pennies, you can put your kid through college. But you better plan on seeing Europe on your television set. And then there's your first night on the beat. 
when you try to arrest a drunken prostitute on a Main Street bar and she rips your new uniform to shreds, you'll buy another one out of your own pocket. And you're going to rub elbows with all the elite. Pimps, addicts, thieves, bums, winos, girls who can't keep an address and men who don't care. Liars, cheats, con men, the class of Skid Row. And the heartbreak. Underfed kids, beaten kids, molested kids, lost kids, crying kids, homeless kids, hit and run kids, broken arm kids, broken leg kids, broken head kids, sick kids, dying kids, dead kids. The old people that nobody wants, the reliefers, the pensioners, the ones who walk the street cold, and those who tried to keep warm and died in a $3 room with an unvented gas heater. You'll walk your beat and try to pick up the pieces. Do you have real adventure in your soul, Culver? You better have, because you're going to do time in a prowl car. Oh, it's going to be a thrill a minute when you get an unknown trouble call and hit a backyard at two in the morning, never knowing who you'll meet. A kid with a knife, a pill head with a gun, or two ex-cons with nothing to lose. And you're going to have plenty of time to think. You'll draw duty in a lonely car with nobody to talk to but your radio. Four years in uniform, you'll have the ability, the experience, and maybe the desire to be a detective. If you like to fly by the seat of your pants, this is where you belong. For every crime that's committed, You've got three million suspects to choose from. Most of the time, you'll have few facts and a lot of hunches. You'll run down leads that dead end on you. You'll work all night stakeouts that could last a week. You'll do leg work until you're sure you've talked to everybody in the state of California. People who saw it happen, but really didn't. People who insist they did it, but really didn't. People who remember, those who try to forget. Those who tell the truth, those who lie. You'll run the files until your eyes ache. And paperwork? Oh, you fill out a report when you're right. You'll fill out a report when you're wrong. You'll fill one out when you're not sure. You'll fill one out listing your leads. You'll fill one out when you have no leads. You'll make out a report on the reports you've made. You'll write enough words in your lifetime to stock a library. You'll learn to live with doubt, anxiety, frustration, court decisions that tend to hinder rather than help you. Dorado, Morris, Escobedo, Cahan. You'll learn to live with the district attorney, testifying in court, defense attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, judges, juries, witnesses. And sometimes you're not going to be happy with the outcome. Maybe your girlfriend's right, Culver. But there's also this. There are over 5,000 men in this city who know that being a policeman is an endless, glamorous, thankless job that's got to be done. I know it too. And I'm damn glad to be one of them. So um, hopefully you get a sense of the vision of the police and the entire world that Jack Webb and Dragnet uh, conveyed. It's a really uh, important show and the 1950s version it particularly, I think uh, is, is quite a great show um, in setting the norms. Now, it established the popularity of the genre so that by the 1960s, it was one of the most popular and widespread genres on television. And then we get to the 1970s where we have the classic era in which you have shows like Hawaii Five-0 and Chips. Um, and some of the changes we see in this era are that there's an increased focus on dramatic action uh, that really, uh, you know, raises the level of violence in these shows, um, both the portrayal of violent crime and the need for violent response. Uh, chase scenes uh, in cars became more uh, commonplace, gunplay became more commonplace. So the idea that Jack Webb had that it's, it's really about the, you know, working stiff who's investigating leads and interviewing people really gets downplayed more for the police seeing, being seen as a job of action and that the entertainment value of the genre is foregrounding action. Um, this is all to raise the dramatic stakes because we have to remember that television is a commercial industry trying to get viewers and ratings and having things be more exciting proved to be a lot more compelling to viewers than uh, three minute monologues. And along the way, it also glamorized police. We saw more and more police who were um, quite handsome. And you can see here in this picture of chips sort of uh, function as almost sex symbols. And I think the way in which police are glamorized and celebrated both as action heroes and as uh, sex symbols is really quite important. So I want to just show you a very brief clip from a uh, 1970s police show called Police Story. 
And this clip, you'll see, it's just a, a brief example. This is the type of way that crime, a criminal act and police intervention was represented in the 70s. Oh my God. Slow Please. boy, you take the vice president. Oh right. Let's have a look at your safe. Oh, oh, Come on. Oh, 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 oh. Police officer, freeze! at first and you get it next no deal you better be ready to die because if you pull a trigger on her I'm gonna blow your head off So hopefully you can get a sense from this uh, you know, brief clip. This is a, a, a very different take on what a policeman does and how they fit within the um, context than what we saw on Dragnet. Um, so the 1980s and 90s is really hailed as the kind of revisionist era in which there are a lot of changes that happen uh, in the genre. So a couple of the, you know, popular and, and long-running examples are Miami Vice from the 80s and NYPD Blue from the 90s. And these shows uh, make some, some important changes and uh, in other ways do, don't make many changes. So for one, one important uh, revision that happens is who is a police person in this um, in in the genre, you have a real growth of women and um, Black Indigenous people of color who are inhabiting the role of police, and uh, you can see this, um, you know, I mean, Miami Vice, where you have, um, you know, Philip Michael Thomas, uh, a black cop on um, NYPD Blue, more uh, women police officers. Uh, Hill Street Blues, another really important uh, revisionist show from the 1980s, had a lot of uh, people of color as cops. And that is quite important because prior to this, it was really a dominant image of, it was, you know, a policeman was a man and was almost exclusively white. And that was very much the norm for the first few decades of television. Um, Probably the biggest innovation of this era was the rise of serialized stories. Dragnet, every episode of Dragnet is standalone. They, you know, the cops encounter a case and they solve the case by the end of the episode. And it's very much this self-contained narrative. And that was very much the norm throughout the 1970s. Um, the 80s with Hill Street Blues, Miami Vice, and then later NYPD Blue, as I said, um, there's much more emphasis on the, the police are characters that have relationships, sometimes with each other, sometimes with you know people outside of the force. And there's a real emphasis on their lives outside of being a uh, police and an emphasis on the idea that there are cases that last and uh, certain uh, issues that are going on in the workplace that uh, persist along every episode. Now, the rise of serialized stories, what it does is it increases viewer engagement and sympathizing with these characters. Dragnet, there was a real sense that 
the policeman was just there to do his job and there was almost no bleed into his personal life. And when we see with these stories, there's a real sense of investment in police characters as people, and thus it humanizes them a lot more. Um, not so much humanizing the criminals, right? So there's a distinction that happens here. And you also have the increase of both a sort of commitment to a stylized glamour. That was what Miami Vice was all about. Um, the the tagline for the show in creating it was MTV cops trying to get that sort of music video feel. Um, and then you also have an emphasis on gritty realism, a real sense of sort of urban decay being represented on screen. Hill Street Blues was, was particularly innovative in that regard. So there's all this sense of upping realism, upping investment in the characters. Um, and I just want to give you a, a, a an example to look at, which is Cadney and Lacey. Cadney and Lacey very uh, notably was um, innovative because the two the two title characters were both police women. And it was really the first show that focused on the lives of police women, uh, both on the force and outside the force and dealt explicitly with uh, issues of sexism that they were facing in the workforce and uh, dealing with, so one of the characters was a mother and trying to, to grapple with her role as a parent and as a cop. As you'll see in this clip, the police that are represented are not white men. Um, and there's a real sense of, there's a different identity as to who is a cop. But I think some of the ways in which police are uh, shown to do their jobs is uh, fairly consistent. So let's look at this clip. As I think you can see, the fact that they're women and that you know their part, the other police um, men seen here as black, doesn't change the fact that they um, use violence and the threat of violence as the way of engaging with the criminal and the sense of the high stakes drama, the dramatic music, this sense that what a cop does is dangerous and necessary because the criminals will resort to violence. They will take innocent people hostage and threaten them with violence. And that sense is really pervasive in the, in the genre uh, in, throughout the, the you know, 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, now I wanna turn to The Wire. And The Wire is seen as uh, one of the most revisionist and really groundbreaking police shows in a number of ways. And it actually, it's, you know, in this era in 2000, in the early 2000s, there are actually two police shows, I think, that were, were sort of landmark uh, revisions of the genre. The other one, which I, I won't talk um, about tonight is The Shield, which um, I, I do have to put a plug in because it was, uh, the show was created by um, Middlebury alum, uh, Sean Ryan. And uh, it's a really great show about corrupt police and the question of can corrupt po police also serve a city and um, how, and what are the costs of that? Um, and I think that, that The Shield really focuses on police at their most extreme um, in terms of being, being corrupt and breaking the law themselves. The Wire is 
has a much different take on the genre that I want to focus on. Um, first and, and foremost, you could argue that The Wire is not actually a cop show, but rather it's a crime show because the the series gives a, a great deal of weight, almost equal weight to the lives of criminals as it does to the lives of police. Um, you can see here in this poster that um, you have, you know, the, the top is an image of two of the main police characters and on the bottom is an image of two of the main criminals. And while yes, there's an adversarial relationship there, there is very much a sense that the criminals are just as important and humanized as the police and a real sense of giving legitimacy to the worlds that the criminals are, are coming from. Um, it also presents police work as tedious and non-glamorous, uh, not particularly violent, although certainly violence does come up, um, much more focused on the process and the procedure. Uh, there's you know, a number of characters who, what they are good at is the paperwork of tracing the, you know, the money trail, of doing the type of legwork that really Jack Webb pioneered in, in Dragnet. Um, and it's not really about the chase. It's not about you know, using guns. It's not about threatening violence. That is, is comparatively rare on the show. And much more is focused on the police as, um, as workers in a way, and really part of an institution that's trying to just deal with the bureaucracy and deal with everything that's coming through the city. And I think quite importantly, it is the first show, the first police show that presents a majority black cast. Um, it took place in Baltimore, which is a majority black city. And it prided itself on its cast being representative of the demographics of the city. Uh, the criminals are not exclusively, but predominantly black, but the police as well have a lot, a lot of black uh, characters uh, in other, in the, the show expands beyond the first season when it's really about the cops and the criminals to a number of other institutions, including the schools and uh, city hall. And the those are incredibly diverse uh, locales as well. So there's a real sense that the type of representations that we see in the show um, are much more wide ranging than any other, not only police show, but I would say any other television show had ever presented. Um, and in that way, it's a real landmark. However, and what I wanna get to now is that it does present a vision of um, policing and violence that I think we have to reckon with now, um, almost 20 years after the show debuted in terms of how we are seeing the role of police violence against black citizens. And uh, in order to deal with this, to present this, I am going to present a video essay. Now, I can, I'd can i be happy to, in the Q&A, talk a little bit about what video essays are and how they work. Um, but in short, I've made a video using footage from The Wire as well as other sources that makes my argument. In some ways, it's a presentation that I'm giving, but instead of using a few clips uh, like I've done right now, um, I'm using a whole bunch of clips all edited together and really presenting my ideas, hopefully in, in a lot more uh, compelling way than uh, a slideshow. The other great thing about video essays is that it doesn't have to be a scheduled event like this with a presenter, but rather it lives on. So this link that I've put in the slides um, will take you to a place where this video essay is published online. Um, I created the video in 2018, and as such, you'll see some of the references I talk about, um, you know, there are a number of absences, like this was before George Floyd. Um, so the, the, unfortunately, there were, were a copious number of references prior to uh, 2018 that I, um, that I referenced, but, uh, there are a lot more that are absent uh, because uh, the situation of police violence against black citizens has uh, persisted. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, screen the video essay and then offer a few concluding remarks and then I look forward to uh, answering your questions.
I think that the the wire is uh, I think you know a, a really in many ways the most interesting and accomplished uh, television police show that has yet been made um, for for many many reasons. Um, however, I do see that looking back at it now, as I try to capture in this video, there is this big hole in, the, in that it is not grappling with this aspect of the police and their relationship to their citizenry, especially their black citizens. And I think that it, it I'm, I haven't seen any other pol uh, television uh, police show since do it any better. Right, so I think that this is a, a big hole that the genre has yet to figure out how to grapple with. I'm I have a little bit of hope um, because the producers of The Wire, um, two of the main writers, the creator David Simon and another main writer George Pelicanos, are have a new project in the works um, called We Own This City that will be on HBO probably next year, um, and it's about the Baltimore Police Department in the aftermath of Freddie Gray in 2015 and uh based on the book that um we own the city and, and really focused on um the side of the police that we don't see in the wire so i'm really curious to see how they approach this um in the uh you know in the aftermath of black lives matter and the freddie gray case specifically to baltimore um i just want to get back to my slides here for one last uh, conclusion to think about, with all this in mind, what do TV cop shows teach us? And obviously we're talking about a genre with decades and decades of history, so there's a lot of the wide range, but just some things I think to think about to leave you with is that throughout crime is always posed as a serious threat that demands a police response. Police, both individual, cops and the institution itself function to protect citizens. These are the underlying values that the genre, no matter how revisionist, it still holds to deeply. And this structures the way that we see police and see crime. And almost all of these shows portray violence and force as a necessary part of the job. That in order to protect citizens, police need to be violent. And this has huge impacts on the lives that uh, are threatened by that violence, as, as we are seeing. And as I tried to make the case in the video and throughout these clips, you can see police are the characters that matter on these shows. Yes, The Wire gives criminals uh, characters and, and histories and personalities more deeply than any other cop show. But I think you can see how still it's the cops who commit an act of injustice and yet still remain the, the heroes and the people who we care about uh, throughout the five seasons. And with that, I'm really looking forward to having a broader conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing that with us this evening, um, especially you know, The Wire, um, the, the in. Uh, clip that you showed. I have personally seen The Wire the whole thing eight times um, and <laughs> listened to to the podcast with uh, Jamel Hill last summer. I'm a huge fan and I really appreciated the narration that you did just kind of illustrating some of those points and putting them into context. Um, I'm just going to check the chat and see what we have in here. This is not from the chat, but as I'm scrolling, I'm going to take the, the opportunity to ask one more question about that. Yeah. Um, with David Simon's uh, previous show previous to The Wire, Homicide Life on the Street, um, I've been very curious, like why more people haven't put that together, like kind of in a, a package with The Wire, looking at it as almost a prequel to The Wire. It has some of the same characters. Yeah. Um, and so I just wondered what you thought, and because what I remember of it, that show, that series I only saw one time, um, is that the cops weren't seen as much as anti-heroes as some of the cops were in The Wire. Yeah. Um, and so I was just curious, like what you what you thought or if it was just part of Simon's um, kind of evolution as, mm -hmm. as a writer and a producer. Um, yeah. if I had the mic for just a second. I wanted to ask that one clarifying question. Yeah, so the Homicide is a great show. It's a NBC show for the, for the 1990s. And um, 
unfortunately it's not available to stream right now mm. so it's so uh, in our current uh world it's very hard to see um it is there's no doubt that homicide is a lot more focused on the police than the wire is in uniform you know pretty much only the police there are very few characters beyond the police that go beyond that um it was based on simon's book simon was a journalist and he spent a year in a homicide uh squad in Baltimore just watching and you know just sort of observing everything and then he wrote a really amazing book providing this insight into what it is like to be a homicide detective in a at the time really uh heavily crime and murder uh saturated city um the tv show is great it is uh i think what it does really really well is it underplays the idea that you know cops need to be violent i think that you know there's very little police violence on that show i think it's more focused on the police trying to find answers and interviewing people like the most dramatic moments in that show are in the box the the interview room um where they're trying to to get uh information out of a suspect and i think that um in terms of, I, I I don't know why it's not streaming. I will say, it, it, you know, Simon actually only came on to work on the show at the very end. It was his book that it was based on, but it was actually produced by Tom Fontana and Barry Levinson, and um, and it aired on NBC. So I don't think that you know, it it would fit very well on HBO alongside The Wire. But alas, that's not the way the the TV industry works. But yes, if if anyone can find a way to get it onto streaming services, I, I think it it would be very appreciated now. Uh, you know, many years later, I show an episode to my students, and and they really enjoy it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm one of those few people that still has the, the DVD <laughs> set, so that's, that's how I still have access to it. Um, one more wire-related question that I'm seeing here um, yeah. is how, um, in your opinion, um, did the, 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 the season that featured the, um, the journalist kind of, um, the journalism episode or season, season five, yeah. um, how do you think that their view of the police um, matched what the other views were. It looks like you know, what this question is, is um, how realistic was that um, in your opinion? How much is that reflective of Simon's own experience? Yeah, I mean, it definitely was very reflective of Simon's own experience. There were a couple other journalists who also were writers on the show. Um, I mean, I think that the, the season five of The Wire, which is the, the kind of journalism season, each season widens the scope of the show. I mean. You certainly know this, but for folks who haven't seen it, each season widens the scope of the show to encompass another institution. Um, so for one, it's City Hall, another one, it's the uh, the school system, and the final one, it's the media itself. And um, I think that the, the way that journalism is portrayed, there is a, I think that season gets a bad rap. A lot of people point to the fact that this was 2008, and there's a real sense that the internet did not exist on the show, right? And, and that, that by this point, uh, David Simon had not been a journalist for almost 10 years. And thus he was really reflecting on an era of journalism that was prior to the internet. And I think that one of the things we're seeing with the internet is the rise of citizen journalism and the cell phone camera you know, videos that I reference in my video um, are a big part of that, right? And I think that there's this sense of journalism being, you know, bifurcated now, where you have citizen journalists and unofficial journalists like bloggers and uh, you know people on social media sharing stories versus the kind of official media like the Baltimore Sun, which is what's represented in the show. So I think that's the the main way that it's unrealistic. The thing I think is really realistic is the way in which it's clear that to the journalists, police are an important source, right? And I think that this is one of the issues at play that um, has been a challenge in the sort of rise of critical takes on police systems in the past few years is that journalists primarily know police as source material and thus there's a sense that they need access and, you know, the, the role of access in journalism is crucial. 
and forges our political coverage and I think also our coverage of crime, especially in cities. So I think that there, that in general, journalists on the wire and in real life are not um, as antagonistic with police departments as often they should be because they have established relationships with, with individual police officers in order to get access to stories and access to scoops. Okay, thank you so much for answering that one. I have a, another that's a follow-up. So it takes a little bit of a, a veer, um, but a great question. Um, Jason asks um, that when you say that police are the characters that matter, are there any important counterexamples that come to mind? And he also says um, that he's thinking of Oh, Simon's the corner, um, which puts the characters who are sometimes framed as, quote, the problem at its center. And are there others that are challenging um, this focus or centrism of the police? Yeah. I mean, and and so the corner, which was uh, a book that um, David Simon and Ed Burns wrote um, after the homicide book, um, and then became an HBO miniseries, which is about essentially a year in the life on a, a drug corner in Baltimore. And it is not about police. It's about the life of people, uh, many of whom are drug addicts and a couple of them are drug dealers and just trying to understand what that life is. Um, it's not a police show or a police book. Um, it arguably can be seen as a crime show. And I think this is the way that a lot of television has broadened the, its scope, focusing on crime and not primarily the police, right? So, mm -hmm. and that can range from like The Sopranos about organized crime or Breaking Bad about a, you know, a drug manufacturer um, in which the police are, are either incidental characters or they are characters who are um, adversaries to the main character. Um, on The Wire, I'm not claiming that the criminals don't matter. And I think that that's one of the things that the show does tremendously well is it humanizes criminals. Um, however, and maybe this is realistic, the criminals don't last as long. There are very few criminal characters who are in the first season who last until the final season. Um, and many of them, it's because they go to prison or they're killed. Um, whereas almost all of the cops last all five seasons. And I think that's one of the points. The example I use of Kevin Johnston, he's a he's not a character, he's just a function, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are other characters who are wonderful, humane characters who are, are criminals. I mean, you know, anyone who likes the wire, you know, I say Omar or Stringer Bell or Wallace. I mean, these these are people you care about, right? These are human beings. D'Angelo, these are characters who are given humanity, who are not simply there as objects for the police to solve, right? They're not problems to solve. They are people. And I think that's one of the things The Wire does, again, better than any other show, is make us understand why these people do what they do and how it's not because they're sociopaths. There are a few sociopaths, but not many in that show. Some of them are in the police department. <laughs> um, and, you know, but I do think that this idea that the criminals are social beings and they're ones who have a lot to teach people, right? About mm -hmm. humanity and making making do and making choices. Um, and I mean, one of the one of the lessons of the show is that once you're in the game, it's really hard to get out. So you have characters who get stuck in the game and end up usually dying because they can't get out. So I've, I've just had a couple new questions come in that I'm, I'm very eager to hear the, your response to as well. Um, so you mentioned about how The Wire is set in Baltimore, predominantly black city, and it also has a predominantly black cast. So given that, um, what's your thought about why David Simon made the choice to center McNulty, who is white, um, as its um, kind of central protagonist that runs through the, the whole uh, series, instead of, say, around a character like Bunk or Daniels or you know, someone else in the police department? Yeah. And I'll, I'll say there, there are a few reasons. I think one is probably um, strategic, the fact that the the show was, you know, not it, it it aired on hbo and the goal was to get the broadest audience possible at the time that it aired it probably had 
it definitely had more black characters in any show in TV history, largely because it had more characters than almost any other show in TV history. And the majority of them were black. I think that there was a recognition that the audience for HBO, while there is a, a very large, a disproportionately large African-American viewership on HBO, especially at that, at that moment, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't enough to sustain the show. So they knew that they needed to reach white audiences as well. So I think having the you know, primary police officer that we focus on be white was somewhat strategic in that regard. That being said, you know, they were also very conscious that McNulty, who is the, the sort of white cop who is the, at the center of season one, he becomes marginal in other seasons. He's, you know, he is far less important in season two. And in season four, he's almost not on the show at all. And there's a real sense that he disappears while other characters sort of take the place. So I think that that's an, an important method that the, the show is using. I think that had Bunk been our main sort of cop protagonist, well, Bunk is great. Every, everyone loves Bunk. There's a sense that, that it may not have had that, um, you know, unfortunately the accessibility to white audiences who at the time and even to this day are just not used to watching a show in which almost all the characters are black. Yeah, and that is telling on so so many levels. I have just maybe room for two more, so I've got two that I think are really interesting. Um, this kind of veers away from, from the wire questions. Um, so uh, while this is not unique to the wire, it's certainly example of a likely large white audience viewing black pain. You're kind of to that point as a follow-up. But this person's question is, are there counterexamples within the show of black joy as a corrective to the dominant culture's steady focus on black pain? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think that I mean, one of the things that um, the the show does is, you know, it the black characters are not just the the criminals and the drug addicts, right? Um, although the majority of the criminals and drug addicts are black, um, there are other black characters who uh, appear regularly. So you mentioned Bunk as an example, as a, a cop, and I think that Bunk is a a fairly joyful character as far as the, the cops go. Um, there are, you know, other non-police characters. Um, I'm thinking of, well, in the in the final season, uh, Gus, the main journalist, Gus, is, uh, is played by Clark Johnson, um, is, you know, a character that is seen as um, incredibly competent and noble in that way. Um, I would say in general, I mean, I'm, I'm a little stumped on this question because I, I totally get the point. I don't think that that black characters are solely there as as um, visions of pain, although they, they often do function that way. But but also, I just don't think that the, the show is a show that embraces joy. It's not a word I, I would use for the show. It is, if those who haven't watched it, I would say, it's a very funny show, right? And it's a fun show in many ways. And I think that it's it's a show that captures something that that many people say, which is that in the most dire situation, you know, gallows humor is the best way to survive. And I think that that's something that the show really embraces. Um, however, it is a show that is deeply cynical about American life and the possibilities of having a, a sort of successful and, uh, you know, um, happy life, given given uh, the circumstances, especially in Baltimore at the time. Um, so yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite say joy, but certainly there are, are many very functional and uh, grounded Black characters, uh, as, as well as uh, the criminals. Right. So uh, this is our, our final question, I think, for the evening. Um, so in as much as television cop shows have been with us for a very long time and are not likely to go anywhere any sooner. Um, in Within the framing and the context of Black Lives Matter, just to bring it back to, to the, the original topic this evening, how do, you, how do you envision television cop shows changing um, or in their portrayal of, of characters and their portrayal of cops, why cops do what they do, why, criminals do what they do. I'm just curious about, about that point. 
It's a great question. And, um, you know, I've talked to a couple people who work in the industry about it. And I think that they're very much at a crossroads right now, that they're not exactly sure what Americans want in terms of watching crime stories. Um, I think there is a sense that the so obviously we we are a country with with great divisions. So there's there is still an audience for a cop show that pretends that Black Lives Matter doesn't exist or matter. Um, I would say a show that is on the air right now that probably fits that bill is called Blue Bloods about a sort of cop family. Um, I think it's a totally unreconstructed cop show. Um, some people call it copaganda. I think you know is a term that's often used. Um, so I think that that type of show will persist. There is an audience for that. Um, in terms of cop shows that are dealing with um, sort of real issues in this way, it's often often used uh, to talk about crime shows that are trying to tackle issues without demonizing criminals, without demonizing uh, people who uh, struggle with substance use or, or whatnot. I think there is a really big question of can you represent some of these realities? I mentioned, you know, we own the city as, I, I, I'm fascinated to see what happens with this show with David Simon and George Pelicanos trying to take on a story in which cops post Freddie Gray essentially sort of use corruption to sort of uh, self enrich rather than reform. Um, I think that the the politics of that could really work. Um, the thing to remember is that The Wire and most of David Simon's shows have always struggled to get an audience. They're never high rated. You have people like you know like you, Rachel, who have watched it eight times, and that that's great. Um, and me, I've watched it five times. Um, but it's uh, but the vast majority of people have never seen The Wire and are not particularly interested. It's a commitment. It's it's. Um, it's a very type, different type of viewing experience than watching an episode of Law and Order, for instance. And I think that, I think that the sort of crime show solving mysteries that resolve in each week is, it serves a need that a lot of TV viewers have for being able to watch something and feel fulfilled at the end of it. And I think shows like that will persist. I, I'm interested to see if shows like the Law and Order franchise. Um, you know the Chicago franchise, the uh, sort of set of set of uh, shows. Um, if if they try to post COVID, go into some uh, you know sort of grappling with the issues raised by Black Lives Matter. If they try to tell these stories, but these stories don't wrap up in a week, right? These stories mm -hmm. don't wrap up with, you know. It would be very easy to do an episode, and I'm sure they all, most of these shows have done an episode about the bad apple who does the bad thing, right? The Derek Chauvin, yes, he's a monster. We dealt with him. Mm -hmm. That's not the story that needs telling, though. The, the story that needs telling is the way that the system reinforces itself, the way that, you know, Lieutenant Daniels in the clips I showed, who is a noble guy and we love him, he teaches Przybylewski how to lie and how to get out of pain for the consequences for what he did. And that's the system. That's the story that needs telling. And that, that's a much harder story to tell. Okay. So I don't have answers, but those are my thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for your thoughts on that and all of our questions and for sharing so much with us tonight. I think it's an incredibly interesting way to, to think about where we are in our current moment and how what we view on television and have viewed on television for as long as we've had television has shaped the ways that we think about crime and criminals. So I really appreciate it. So um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Again, my name is Rachel Edens and I'm the Community Programs Officer with Vermont Humanities Council. And thank you so much for visiting us with us our last digital first Wednesdays of the year. Thank you, good night. Thank you.